I uh, recruited the help of, um, we'll just call him Andrew. He kind of looks like Andrew from over here. All right, big tough guy. You know, I recruited his help here today, so you'll just know who he is. And, and I tell you, we're going to just kind of put him right here for right now, okay? Um, I hope you can see him. Uh, let's just see. That's got to hurt. Oh, well, you'll just have to hurt. We'll put him right there, okay? And we're going to lock him in there real good, you know? We'll get to that in just a minute. Wilson Bentley was the first known photographer of snowflakes. You ever thought about taking pictures of a snowflake? He pursued his passion for over 50 years. His collection of 5,381 snowflake photos was published in his magnum, mag, magnum, magnus, I can't even say it, opus, snowflake, snow crystals. Wilson Snowflake, he's known as, Bentley, died a fitting death that symbolized and epitomized his life. He contracted pneumonia while walking six miles through a severe snowstorm taking pictures of snowflakes. And he died December the 23rd, 1931. We should die the same way. No, not in a snowstorm, not with pneumonia, but doing what we love to do. Pursuing God-ordained passions. We're in a series of sermons called Caged. Thus we have the cage. Caged. It is a series based on the scripture when Jesus said, You are truly my disciples if you keep obeying my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth, of course, is the Bible. It's the Word of God. But we put ourselves in cages, don't we? We put ourselves in cages. And what that scripture simply means is Jesus unlocks the cage, opens the door. Now the problem is that sometimes we're like this dude. We don't want to come out. You see, usually in a bird cage, you have, you have water, you have food, you have your treats, you have paper to poop on. You know, you, you have everything there. It's kind of comfortable. It's, it's kind of nice. You know, you don't see any reason to leave that cage, even though the door may be wide open for you to fly out, fly free. And so we have these cages that we put ourselves in. And the next six weeks, I want to talk to you about these cages that we don't want to come out of. We just kind of find a comfortable place. And why should we? It's comfortable. We, we have what we need. Well, let me tell you why you should, because God wants you to fly. God wants you to go after your God-ordained passion. That's why we need to get out of the cage. So we're going to talk about these cages, and maybe you can identify with one of these cages during this next six weeks. And if you do, I promise you, it'll set you free. Because this represents how Jesus has unlocked the door, he's opened it, and says fly, but many refuse to fly. We like our comfort zones, don't we? The average person will spend approximately half his waking hours at work. Over a lifetime, most people will spend 100,000 hours on the job. That's a lot of time, isn't it? I got some good advice for you that uh, I read the other day in dealing with this issue. You got to work so much, get a comfortable chair. <laughs> Secondly, don't pursue a career. All oh, stay with me. Don't pursue a career. See, here's our mistake. We start out pursuing a passion and we end up settling for a paycheck. We make a living, not a life. 
And our deep-rooted passion gets buried beneath our day-to-day -day responsibilities. And that's the first of six cages I want to talk to you about this morning. Now, don't get me wrong. We do need to take care of our responsibilities. We have to pay our bills. We have to wash our dishes. We have to plan our future, right? And I read this quote the other day, and it just kind of is fitting. Our greater responsibility is pursuing our God-ordained passions. If we allow less important responsibilities to displace the, important, the more important ones, then you are living in the cage of irresponsible responsibility. Don't settle in the cage when God has placed an ordained passion in your life and he's opened the door and said, go after it. Go after it. But, but I don't, hold on. Let me give you a Bible example here, okay? Jesus said to another person, come be my disciple. The man agreed. But then he said, Lord, first, let me return home and bury my father. Jesus replied, let those who are spiritually dead care for their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach the coming of the kingdom of God. Now, that seems like a, a fair request from this young man, okay? But you need to understand his father wasn't dead yet, okay? And this guy wanted to wait until his father died and then bury him. Jesus saw through the spiritual smoke screen. This man was turning a responsibility into an excuse. Yes, yes. Bury his father, and burying his father was simply a tactic to kind of delay things for a while. He allowed a less important responsibility to get in the way of the greatest responsibility of all, and that is to follow Christ. You understand where I'm going with this? See, we do that. Our responsibilities, we turn our responsibilities in excuses. How many people do you know that says, yeah, one day I'd like to do this. And one day comes and they say, yeah, one day I'd like to do this. You know, when my kids are grown, I'll go do this. You know, when I have enough money, I'll go do this. You know, when I'm feeling better, I'll go do this. I'll go chase this passion of mine. I'll follow Christ when I get all this stuff taken care of. Our responsibilities become a form of irresponsibility. Our responsibilities become a cage that keeps us from chasing our God-ordained passions. And the only way out is this, is responsible irresponsibility. The will of God often feels irresponsible. You're called to decide or to act on what seems to make no sense. I mean, tithing doesn't make sense. Giving to God financially when you have needs of your own is like, what does that, that's crazy. Yes, it is, but it is a spiritual responsibility. But responsible irresponsibility is refusing to allow your human responsibilities to hinder your God-ordained passions. Now enters Moses. I told you we're going to be talking about Moses. Now enters Moses. <laughs> he was doing this. Our study on Moses reveals that he had a passion for his people. When he killed an Egyptian at the age of 40 in the defense of his brother Israelite, he was upset. He had a passion for his people, so he defended them. Then, of course, he had to flee from Pharaoh to Midian. He meets a wife, has a couple of boys, and he supports them by tending sheep. He's out in the wilderness. Some 40 years later, God calls him oddly from a bush that is burning in the wilderness. The bush isn't burning up, it's just burning. And a voice calls him, and it's God's voice. I love this. And God says, Moses, 
The door's open. Pursue your passion. Go get the children of Israel. Pursue your passion. And I'm sure for a moment, Moses' heart may have kind of leaked inside of him as he thought of it first. And then in the back of his mind, there's this voice. I have a family. I have responsibilities now. It's pretty risky to put my life out there and risk my life and be irresponsible. And all of a sudden, the fear came. All of a sudden, the excuses started flowing. Then came these excuses why he shouldn't be responsible for the greater responsibility. <laughs> and you'll find them in Exodus 3 and 4. Insecurities. He says to the Lord, who am I? Who am I that they'll listen to me? And then doubt. They won't believe me. This is after his conversation with God. They won't believe me. And then there's this inadequacies. God, I'm, I'm clumsy with words. I don't speak well. So I won't be able to even talk to Pharaoh. I won't be able to talk to Israel. God takes care of that problem. You know, God, God takes care of that. And then there's this other one. He's comfortable. Not fulfilled in life, but he's comfortable. Okay? He, he, Moses again pleads, Lord, please send someone else. Lord, I, I'm comfortable where I'm at. I'm okay. Send somebody else. Send somebody else to do this great and wonderful task. Send someone else to chase my passion. Send someone else to do what you call me to do. Go ahead and send somebody else. I'm kind of comfortable here, Lord. <laughs> Man, Moses attempted to avoid this God-ordained passion. And God said, no, nope, I'm not going to let you do it. I'm not going to let you settle. I'm going to stay after you. And you know what he does that to us? He does that to us. We may think we're comfortable. We may say, Lord, leave me alone, but he keeps coming at us. He keeps saying, no, I I've got a call on your life. No, I've got something for you to do. I've put this passion in your heart. Go after it. Now, if we are, are to break out of this irresponsible responsibility cage and fly, I mean, if we are to get out of this thing and, and really, I don't like that guy. He won't stand up. Will he stand up? And really conquer this. There. Ah. Anyway, you get the point. There, dude. There. Ah. If we're to get out of this cage and fly, there's, I, there's four things that I want to help you to learn from this story this morning that will help you to break out of this irresponsible responsibility deal. No, I'm not telling you to forget your responsibilities. Keep that in mind. But I'm telling you that that can't control what you do as far as your passion is for God. And this is how you do it. There's four things. Number one, the first thing you need to learn is forget qualifications. Forget being qualified. Uh, you know, people, people have a trouble with this. Well, I'm not trained to do this. I would love to do it, but I'm not qualified. You know, I would, I would love to help with the, the youth, but I'm not qualified. I'd love to go on the mission field, but I, I, I'm not qualified for that. Forget that stuff. Look at the scriptures. Exodus, Exodus 3, 2 and 3 says, Then the Lord asked him, What do you have there in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it on the ground. Moses throws it on the ground. And God turns it into a snake. A miracle happens. He eliminated Moses' excuse right there. You're not qualified, but I am. You can't do it, but I can. I just need a vessel. I want to work through you. You know, we use excuses like education. I don't have enough education. Uh, money, time, family. These are excuses. Some health issues. 
These are only a few of the excuses that we use. But God takes them all away. Because you know what? He heals us. He wants to include our family with our passion. You know, these are the things. Education, he will teach you as you go. You know, money, God will provide. God does, takes care of it all. If you step out in faith, man says, look, show me and I will believe you. God says, no, you believe me and I will show you. You take steps of faith and I will show you. And here's the, here's, here's the point. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Bottom line. Like using a farmer, Noah, to build an ark to save the world. Like using a shepherd boy, David, to fight a Philistine giant twice his size. Like using a murderer, Paul, to write half of the New Testament. When God puts a passion in your heart, whether it is relieving hunger around the world, educating a Brazilian child, tutoring a child off of your own street, serving coffee or vacuuming the floors at the church, whatever it may be, when God puts this passion in your heart to do it, that God-ordained passion becomes your responsibility and now you have a choice to make. Are you going to make excuses and be irresponsibly responsible or responsibly irresponsible? What's your choice? God qualifies you as soon as he moves in your heart. As soon as he gives you a burden, a, a, a moving in your heart, a draw, a pull to do something, he qualifies you. He says, you go. That's your qualification. So forget qualifications. You got God. You get God. It would be great if all of us could go back to school. And now in our 20s, 40s, 60s, 80s, that we know what we love to do, we could go back and get educated. And I challenge you to do it if you still can do that. But understand this. When you have a passion in your heart to do something for God, you've got to just go after it. God tells you to go back to school, go back to school. That's fine. He'll get you through it quickly. But he qualifies you. He helps you. Number two. You want to break out of this cage? You want to fly? Number two. Have fun in learning. Have fun in learning. I love this next portion of scripture and how God teaches Moses. So Moses threw down the staff and it became a snake. Moses was terrified, so he turns and runs away. Then the Lord told him, take hold of the tail. This is the guy that's scared to death of snakes. And God says, no, go back and pick it up. Okay. So Moses reaches out and grabs it and it becomes a shepherd's staff again. It's like, God, I know God was teaching Moses, but I want you to get the picture here of this personality of God. It's fun. It's fun. He's not teasing Moses. He's having a good time with Moses. He's, he's, I know you're scared of snakes, but here, I'm going to turn that thing into a snake. Yeah, pick it up. So Moses is, 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 you know, God is having a great time teaching Moses. I don't know if Moses is having a good time learning. But I think that's where we have to correct, right? <laughs> Moses, God is saying to him, you have no idea of the joy it is to follow this call, this passion that I put in your heart. You have no idea how much fun it's going to be learning what I want you to learn following that passion. You have no idea. You want to say, you're speaking to a bush, dude. 
How fun is that? And the bush is talking back to you. How fun is that, man? See, God-ordained passions do not have to be strife and strain. Oh, I got to do this for God. Oh, I got to do that for God. Oh, I don't want to keep kids in the nursery because then I'm trapped for 45 years in the nursery. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, ladies? I got to do this. No. You follow God's passion for your life, it becomes a joy learning. You make mistakes, absolutely, but laugh it off. Failure is just fertilizer for the future. Okay? You know, you just laugh it off. God is teaching you. Moses made plenty of mistakes. I don't know how long it took him to go back and pick up the snake. It could have taken a long time. The Bible doesn't say that. I mean, he, he may have waited three days, you know, because he was afraid. But eventually he did and he learned. What cool thing that must have been. Pick up a stick and it turns into a snake. God's having fun. Moses... Just needs to chill out and have fun. We need to chill out and have fun when we're following God's call in our lives. The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord. Have fun in the Lord. Have fun following him. There's too many sad-faced, boring, dull Christians they're mean. We need to loosen up, put some smiles on our face. We need to have some fun. We're not going to lose. You ever seen the confidence of a, of, of a winner? People call them arrogant. You know, people call them prideful. People call them all these names, but they know they're confident in their abilities. They know that they're most likely going to win. With God on our side, we do win. So you know what? Let people call you arrogant. Let people call you proud. Let people call you these names. Walk with confidence because you win. Have fun. When you make a mistake, you know what? You got about, I don't know, a day or so, think about it, and then you get up and you do it again. Don't stop. We need to enjoy the journey that we're on, where God is leading us. We need to have fun with it. <laughs> God didn't send Moses to school. He taught him, this is cool, he taught him in his current employment in the wilderness with a bunch of dumb sheep. God taught him. Now, if God can teach Moses there, no matter what employment you're involved with now, you may want out of it desperately, and God wants to get you out of it, but let him teach you while you're there and have fun while you're there. See, God is not limited of where he can teach us. In fact, I kind of think he enjoys meeting us in our wilderness. Where you are right now isn't the issue with God. It's where God is training you to go. That's the issue. So why not enjoy it and have a good time with it? I read this commentary the other day or this, this quote the other day. I want to read it to you. I don't know this guy. I just read it, but it's kind of cool. The voice we should listen to most as we choose our vocation is the voice that we might think we should, we should listen to least. And that is the voice of our own gladness. What can we do that makes us the gladdest? I believe that if it is a thing that makes us truly glad, then it is a good thing and it is our thing. Isn't that true? Yeah. We always choose things with might make us the most money. We choose things that, well, that looks like a good career. It'll make a lot of money. The benefits are great. This is great. And that's great. You know, but it's going to be a lot of hard work. And we go on this journey and we hate it. 
We despise it, but we have to do it. I disagree. I disagree. I believe God wants that joy in your heart. And I don't care what you do. That doesn't determine your success. That doesn't determine your finances. When you have God on your side, you have all the benefits you need. Go after it. Well, that doesn't make sense, Pastor. Then read the Bible. Because without faith, we're not going to please God. Without faith, we're not going to please Him. Look, you, what makes you glad? It might be, I don't know, cleaning out toilets or something. Maybe, you know, those portable potties. Maybe you would love doing that. I want to tell you something. If you do, and maybe you do it today. I don't know. Maybe you're a guy that does that. That's, that's cool. If you do, go after it. Have fun doing it. What more fun could you do? Man, you know, to pick up toilets and watch people make fun of you. That'd be a lot of fun. You know, wait till somebody goes in it and then pick it up. That'd be a lot of fun. My point is this, guys. Enjoy the journey you are on right now. Okay? Have fun learning with God. When we delight ourselves in the Lord, new desires are conceived within us. So you probably won't stay where you are if you learn to delight yourself in the Lord. Number three, you want to fly? Quit praying. Quit praying. Here's a pastor telling you to stop praying. Stay with me. Look at the scripture. Exodus 4, 11 through 14. God says to Moses, who makes mouths? The Lord asked him. Who, who makes people so they can speak or not speak? Hear or not hear? See or not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. And do as I have told you. I will help you speak well, and I will tell you what to say. Now, if you know me, you know I believe in lots of prayer. And if you're going to fly, you have to pray. But here's prayer makes us spiritually fertile, it really does. And the more we pray, the more passionate we become. Yet, sometimes, like Moses, God has answered, but we're just not moving. Yeah. We're just not moving. <laughs> What's God supposed to do when you won't move? Why continue to ask God to do something for us when he has already empowered us to do it. One of the mistakes we make is asking God to do something for us, what God wants us to do for him. Take action. Get moving. Well, I don't know where to start. Well, try by getting up and taking a few steps. But they say, do you hear that? They say, I don't care what they say, I don't know who they are, doesn't matter. Do what God tells you to do. Do what he says to do. Go after it. Jesus didn't come to just pray for us. He did pray for us, but he didn't come just to pray for us. He came to act for us. And we're to do the same for him. It bugs me. When I see injustice and I see Christian people who know better seeing it but not doing anything about it, that bugs me. Doesn't it you? It bugs me. When I see Christians ignoring needs that they can do something about, that bothers me. And it shouldn't happen. Go after it. So, yeah, stop praying and act on what God has already taught, called you to do. You see, 
I read this scripture the other day and it really spoke loud and clear to me. And God was talking to Israel about taking the land. And he says, little by little, I will give you the land. God leads us a step at a time. We want God to be a, like a, you know, drive through <laughs> Just drive up and he answers our prayers and he moves us from here to over here. But God, God wants to teach us step by step by step. But you know what? We have to do the first step first. And what's the first step? And that's doing what he asks you to do now. What he wants you to do right now. Last, you want to fly? Give your best daily. Hear me with this one. Give your best to God daily. Wherever you are. You go to work, you give your best to God daily. You don't work for that boss. You work for God. We were talking about this yesterday morning. God, the Bible says God is the one that gives you the promotions. And the Bible says, do all for the glory of God. Whatever it is, word or in deed, you do it unto him. Give your best daily. Because remember, your job is not your ultimate thing probably. It might be for some of you, but your, your ultimate thing is the passion that's in your heart that you're going after. And so it's a journey, and you've got to give your best. Let me go to the scriptures here. And we're going to jump over to chapter 4, verses 24 through 26, a very confusing portion of scripture, actually. Moses, his family, Aaron, are off to Egypt. They're journeying. He's obeying in action, it seems. Okay? On the journey, the Bible says, when Moses and his family had stopped for the night, the Lord confronted Moses and was about to kill him. What is going on here? But Sephora, his wife, took a flint knife and circumcised her son. She threw the foreskin at Moses' feet and said, What a blood-smeared bridegroom you are to me. When she called Moses a blood-smeared bridegroom, she was referring to the circumcision. After that, the Lord left him alone. Now, what's the big deal here? What is this? God eliminated Moses' excuses, but Moses was still uncommitted totally to the task. He was disobedient. Not yet all in. There was still some things in his life. There was still a few things he was holding back on. And this was one of them. And what's the big deal about circumcision? For Israel, it was the outward sign of a relationship with God. God was forever to be their God. They were to be his people, and it was the mark of ownership. You'll find that in Genesis chapter 17, verse 7. And God made this covenant with Abraham. Now, you move over to the New Testament. Of course, Jesus kind of settled that matter. Don't get too concerned here, all right? Jesus settled that matter. And then later Paul says this. And true circumcision is not a cutting of the body, but a change of the heart produced by God's spirit. In one version it says you need to circumcise your heart. You need to give God ownership yes, yes. of your heart. You need to give God everything. You need to cut out everything everything, even the things that are hidden, the detailed things that are hidden that you have not yet given to God and you're holding back on because you're still kind of like, mm, I'm not sure. There's a lot of Christians that do that. Look, if God's giving you a, a passion and a drive to do something, you know, the littlest things 
can keep you in the cage. Smallest things. Because it's lack of faith. God's convicted of you. God said to do it. It's right there, but you hadn't done it. How in the world is Moses going to go, go take care of Israel when he's holding back this little thing here, which was a big thing to God? You see, many are unsuccessful with their pursuit of what God has for them because it's half-hearted. It's not all in. And the Bible says you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. That's how you pursue it. Everything is about you. Do you know what that passion is? You know what that dream is? That's your first step. What has God put you on this planet to do? What, what is in your heart? What makes you sad, mad, and glad all at once? Go from there. Start down that road. You know what? You might start down this road and God may just kind of lead you a little bit. But at least you're starting. Right? So give your best to God daily. You start where you are, like at work. Stop complaining. Gosh, Christians, stop complaining about your job. Stop complaining about your family. Stop complaining about where you are. And start delighting yourself in God. Start delighting yourself at work because then God will lead you. He will use right where you are. It may be the furthest thing you can think about that is from your goal and where you want to be and what you're doing now, but God will teach you right here how to get to over here. But it's all about attitude. It's all about attitude. It's all about delighting yourself in God. And it's all about getting rid of all the little things that God tells you to do and circumcising your heart saying, God, my heart is totally for you. My heart is yours. I'm going to cut away all the junk that's been there for probably 25 years, some of us. I'm going to cut away all the hurt, all the pain, all the, wor all the wounds, all the rejection. I'm going, to, I'm going to cut away all the disappointments. I'm going to cut away all the, the, the sin that keeps haunting me every day. I'm going to cut away my past. I'm going to cut away everything, Lord, and I'm going to let it be yours. Well, let it be yours. You know what? I get tired of people coming and singing these wonderful songs to the Lord. Take my life. Let it be yours. And we walk out of here and treat our families like dirt. Complain about our jobs. Mumble and grumble about life. Though that frustrates me. I have done it too. And it frustrates me about me. I don't like doing that. Now, the thing is, is we have an amazing, gracious, merciful God. And all you got to do is say, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me for that. And you know what? He leaves you alone and says, okay, let's go now. But see, we have to identify it. We have to identify it. What's your passion? Do you even know? Well, here's where you start. You find a need and you meet that need. You find a need and you meet it. I, I throw this question out at people all the time and we've used it quite a bit around here. Money wasn't a problem. You knew that you could not fail and you had the support of everybody that's around you. Think with me for a moment. What would you do? Now, men, don't tell me you'll play in the Super Bowl. <laughs> that's ridiculous. You gotta understand. All right? Sorry, dudes. You're a little out of shape for that. It's a little out of your range. Okay, hold back. Just stay in the stay in the couch. And fantasize. 
Anyway. But think about that. What really makes you come alive? What really makes you come alive? It might be something like, you know, I don't know, working in an elderly home. It might make you come alive. Working with children might make you come alive. Maybe building a house, it might make you come alive. You know what would make you come alive? Might be being a doctor. Awesome. Awesome. Might be a missionary. Yeah, I'd go to the mission field. Then that is what you start pursuing. There's where you start. Right there. Start there. God will lead it from that point. But the problem is, is we don't think about those things because we, we think it's impossible. No. No. It's not impossible. It's time to cut away everything and say, Lord, I'm going after you. Fly from the cage of irresponsible responsibility. Forget qualifications. Have fun learning. Quit praying and act and give your best daily.